to add more value to our business community here in Southfield. I feel like it's important that we um, really dig our feet into this because I'm sure you all are aware that Southfield businesses have been leaving and we want to stop that. Um, I think it's important to continue to build and maintain this uh, strong business community that we are able to have. So, um, with your help and the help of other chambers, uh, and our business community, I think it's certainly possible to do that. So I want to engage you, the council members, um, you know, come to our meetings, uh, our different committees that we have, uh, the different networking events that are available to you. Um, that's all, um, um, that invitation is open for you to attend. Uh, and if it's okay, I can put you on our email distribution list. So every Monday, you'll get an email with different news um, that's going on here in Southfield, which I'm sure you're probably pretty aware of. Uh, the different events that we have throughout the month, and then <coughs> a spotlight on our members. So we won't spam you. We'll just provide you with some real basic information as to what the chamber is doing. You can sign me up. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank I'll you. One other thing. Sure. Very quickly. Um, I know you probably read all kinds of publications, but I think we have so much to learn from Grand Rapids. Uh, um, between our prize and now this latest thing that they're doing, the five by five night uh, for startup businesses. Uh, I know they got some deep pockets over there, but um, I, I clipped these knowing you were coming. I appreciate <laughs> that. So um, <laughs> it's just really inspiring what, what they're doing there. And if you've been to Grand Rapids, you can just see this tremendous turnaround downtown. Um, uh, that, that city has really done a lot. So, you know, those are for you, Tanya. I appreciate uh, that. And, uh, you know, as the new director, I'm, I'm teachable and open to, you know, learn how we can help this business community. So definitely uh, do this research here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And please can speak up a little louder. Yeah, you can hear me. So. Okay. Yeah, Thank you so much. Next we have... Uh, we talk some recommendations in the next two. The next one is the request from Rabbi Mendel Stein. Rabbi Stein, please come forward and know the names of us here. Good evening. I'll try and raise my voice so everyone can hear me. Good. That's good. <laughs> um, I'm with the Chabad Lubavitch organization um, based in Oak Park, 14100 West Nine Mile Road. Um, I'm personally a resident of Southfield for the last couple of years, and I'm proud to be one. Um, we're very happy and excited that once again the city of Southfield is allowing the menorah to be placed on the lawn and out the window. Um, uh, for me, it's the first time being involved with it since the menorah that was donated in the past has expired, and I was able to help the uh, fund raise a little bit of money to get a new one, and I want to just thank the city and all the council members for allowing it and joining together with uh, literally hundreds of other cities across the country who are also displaying different religious displays um, funded by local organizations. Um, on the city property, including in front of the White House, there's going to be a manure lighting there, which presidents have taken part in in the past, other dignitaries. Um, I want to thank the uh, <laughs> Department of Public Works and the Department of Parks and Recreation for installing the, the tube, which we can affix the manure to it and running the wires. And um, I think the manure also has a very universal message, which is <coughs> spreading light over darkness which if you have a room that's absolutely dark and you light just a little candle, it gives a lot, a lot of light, which may not be noticeable when the sun is shining. But unfortunately, our world can be looked at as like a dark world in a lot of ways, but if you light just even one small candle, it sheds a lot of light. So I'm um, proud to be a part of this, and I thank you for your help if you have any questions. I understand you are having some sort of a celebration that you wanted us to do. Yeah, I want to invite um, everyone here council members, anyone else, we're going to light the menorah on Wednesday night at 5.30. Um, this coming Wednesday night, the menorah will hopefully be put up tomorrow, and on Wednesday night, the holiday's coming ready, there's no time to wait. So we'll light the menorah, and we'll share more inspiring messages, and celebrate the freedom that our country has, which is the freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, 
the, the cleanest way is the way that we've, uh, we think we've chosen to do it, which would require a subcontracting. Right now, we have, I don't know if any of you have heard of um, Access Point. It's an employee leasing company based in Novi. We, Access Point actually um, employs all of our employees at the field zone. We pay a fee to them. They cover all the benefits. They cover the taxes. They do the payroll. So we, in a way, subcontract our employees to them, not the operation. Boys and Girls Club would take over that responsibility. Our payroll is 82% of our entire budget. That's aside from all the other expenses we have, the, the printing machine and the supplies and the repairs and maintenance and the food and, and pop and stuff that we have there. But 82% of our total budget is, is, the, um, is the staff. Some of the savings that, well, there are a couple things. One, under this agreement, the Boys and Girls Club would take over that entire responsibility. So right now, we're, um, uh, we have inverse profit, if you will, of uh, <laughs> another way of saying we're, we're bleeding, uh, $12,000, $13,000 a month. <laughs> So there's, there's two points there. One, they would take over the staff, two, and that's what we talked to our staff about tonight. Two is that our, if you take our staff, <coughs> and, and uh, we have an executive director for two years, that was Lauren King, now interim is Linda Neighbors, <coughs> many of you know. Uh, then take our operations manager, that was Kevin Lartique, and now is Peter Banks. And then take our program manager, which first was Chrissy Wafers, then Danielle Abrams. So those are our three full-time, highest paid employees, um, a couple of them have benefits, and then we have all of our part-time staff. So 82% of our total budget is our staff. About 70, 75% of our total staff budget is the top three people. One of the beauties of this arrangement is that the Boys and Girls Club already has an executive director, someone that's over all of their clubs. They have an operations manager, they have a programs manager, they have something that we've all talked about before that we would love to have, but we can't afford, a development director. Someone that full-time is out trying to raise money for the Boys and Girls Clubs. That would give us all of those components. So we would save on those upper-end admin people. We would still need a club director. They have a club director. They have, I, I believe, a club director over all the clubs, and then they have a unit manager for each um, club. We would have that we would still have some staff, but we would save significantly on both the payroll and they're taking over all the payroll, so it'd be significant. Um, I think you all have a copy of the agreement, um, and I'll be happy to answer questions, but first I wanted to introduce you to the Executive Director of the Boys and Girls Club of South Oakland County, Brett Kalander. And Brett, um, if we could, maybe he could tell you his background, how he is with the Boys and Girls Club, and what his plan or vision is. So what was the last name? Talander. T-I-L-L-A-N-D-E-R. I'll pass a card around and I will also speak up so everyone can sure. It's T-I-L-L-A-N-D-E-R. And it's Brett, B-R-E-T-T. -T. First of all, um, Council President, thank you and Council Members for inviting uh, me to be here tonight. I just want to let you know this opportunity to connect with Southfield will be my third tour through Southfield. I with Catholic Social Services and the American Heart Association and I've enjoyed my time working in Southfield, but since 2001, I've had the opportunity to be the Executive Director for Boys and Girls Clubs of South Oakland County. And my time there started when I was 15 years old, a kid in high school looking for a part-time job, who had a part-time job at Burger King that wasn't working out too well. <laughs> and I wanted to work somewhere where it really fed me, and that was the Boys and Girls Club. And um, just to speak to what matters most here, is what you've created in the field zone is amazing and Boys and Girls Clubs get started in communities because a community comes forward and says we want a safe place for kids. You did that by creating the field zone. And when we were approached, um, there isn't some, we're all autonomous organizations. There is a national organization that's supported by the locals, but there is not some ivory tower that can look and tell us what to do. We're all locally controlled. It's a little different than some other models. The only way a club gets started is the community reaches out and says, we want a club here. And in Washington Township, that happened last month. A former club member of ours lost his 20-year-old son to cancer. And two years ago, he came to me a month after his son died and said, I want to leave a legacy for my son, and I'd like to do it. I get those calls a lot. I was really surprised, and it happened. Mm. They raised the money, and they're open. Um, here, when the opportunity in Southfield arose, 
a church reached out to us. We weren't, you know, I've always had a second home here. My brother grew up here. I've always felt comfortable and known there's tremendous need. You saw that need with the creation of the field zone. <coughs> the church reached out to us and said, we have a beautiful gym, beautiful facility, and it's just not being used well enough. And we started the discussion with them, and I went out to Boys and Girls Clubs of America because there was some seed money available to be able to create this club. And just as we were moving forward, their plans changed. And I called Cheryl Thames, who's a good friend of mine with Optimus, and I said, Cheryl, I said, do you know anybody in Southfield? Right, right person to call with Cheryl, right? And I said, do you know anybody in Southfield? Somebody with the school, somebody within the community. And she said, I, don't, I can't believe that you're calling me about this. I said, why? She said, I need to put you in touch with the folks at the field zone because they need funding to go forward. That's how we end up here today. So as much as I'd like to say there's some great strategic plan and a beautiful uh, goal that was set, there really wasn't. It was just people doing the right thing almost three years ago now, creating the field zone. And then a church who reached out and said, we want to do this in Southfield, that it didn't work out, <coughs> and the money still sat. So that's where we're at. That's why we're here. And there may be some questions I'd love to answer, and I know Scott's got more detail. Um, I know your t job is tough, and I know the night is long, so I'm going to stop talking and answer any questions that you have for either of us. So. I started a attempted to start a teen club. We formed a committee. We ran about two months, three months, four months. Then we went to council at that time. It fell on deaf ears. Nothing happened. They once took it off the agenda and we had a meeting in the lobby. Deaf ears. Now there's here's a dream come true. You're going to make a success out of it. And these kids are going to stop falling through the cracks now, as they have been. So I'm very pleased to have all my cooperation, or whatever I can do, I will do. And I will help. Thank you so much. You know, either, either one could answer that. How are the two uh, going to accomplish what Field Zone set out to do, and that is to bring the young people from the schools and get them off the street out of the library and get them some disciplines and get them some mentoring and those kinds of things. How does this work? I'm familiar with Boys and Girls Club because Ed Lefebvre, who's the president of, of the bank <laughs> in Royal Oak, was uh, very instrumental in that. And uh, he used to be uh, in, in the bank of Southfield originally. Uh, but uh, he was always out hustling for them and, and that was always a, a rewarding role for him and he got me involved in it at that time. <coughs> but how do these two groups going to work together and accomplish the same goal that you each have? Well, a lot of our goals are similar and we do a lot of the things the same. But the Boys and Girls Club has been around for uh, 105. 105 years and the Royal Oak Club for 53 years. <laughs> so they've had a lot more experience and they, they have uh, real measurable, <coughs> they do a program they know how many participated, what the exit surveys were, they frankly better than what we do. On the other hand, they've looked at our programs and said, you do some things that we've never even thought about here. So there's definitely some synergy possibilities. We do some things differently. Um, some of their clubs are like ours, middle school and high school. Some of them are from six to 18. We don't anticipate lowering our age, but it's, it's, uh, you have to have a unique facility to be able to separate um, kids that are that far apart in age. We don't have that. So um, we'll, we'll keep it like it is now. They have um, some different, uh, not different, they have some goals that are more distinct, refined, stated than what ours are. You've heard our mission statement, and we want to give kids a safe place. We want to develop them into leaders. We want to um, uh, give them alternative activities to do. We want to give them, while they're there, we don't want just to be a latchkey program. We want to say, what would you like to learn? What skill would you like to develop? You know, those kinds of things. Um, and so we've done that. But why don't you, we have 200 to 300 students as members. Um, we charge $75 per semester for four months, so it's $225 a year. 
they charge $25 a year. They have 1,700 members at their club. Um, so that's a little bit different. We're not going to change anything right away, but with, I mean, we'd like to have more <laughs> members, so that's definitely a possibility. We want to be inclusive. As you all know, we provide scholarships. Their philosophy is that a lot of people that could get a scholarship won't apply because they don't want that stigma. They don't want their child to be embarrassed. The parent doesn't want to be embarrassed, so they just don't apply. Whereas if it was $25, they would come and take part. Why don't you talk about the two or three mainstay goals that you have? In, it is an amazing fit for me. I, I wouldn't be, you know, an organization in these times. It's the tough. I mean, you're preaching to the choir, everybody in this room. The toughest times that Michigan has ever seen, ever seen. So for us to go forward in a leap of faith, I can't risk partnering up with something that doesn't align. And what was amazing was the alignment that is there with the programs and services. <laughs> First of all, the dedication to the age group, for me personally, is also where you get the biggest bang for your buck. Because the, age the ages that the field zone is servicing now, they're making the decisions that are going to alter the rest of their life's course. Are they going to graduate? Are they going to be able to graduate and not have caused a pregnancy or been pregnant? Are they going to be able to make sure that they don't have contact with law enforcement? Those are the, th in 10 years, and I always say 10 years, it's probably longer than that. And I spent many times in the Fever's <coughs> office, and he, you know how passionate he was about clubs. Since the, uh, <coughs> the last 10 years, and this is probably true longer than this, we've had zero teen pregnancies either where a girl has been pregnant or a boy has been participant to a pregnancy. 100% of our kids have graduated. We've had one kid who has gotten a GED. But for him, it was a huge, the first kid in his family to graduate from high school, and he did it through a GED. Um, and our kids don't get in contact with law enforcement. So we have that. That's what we look for. So we want that graduation rate, and we're going to raise the bar because, you know what, just graduating from high school today isn't enough. You used to be able to walk into the plants and be <coughs> able to get a job and raise a family and have benefits and a pension. Everybody knows those, <coughs> those days set in Michigan a long time ago. So we're going to have kids who are really engaged with what's going on. So I see that the programs go well together. I'm not concerned about there being friction or uh, a bad fit at all. <coughs> I want to also clarify something that was said earlier. The work that has been going on at the field zone has been incredible for the years that it's been open. It has had tremendous impact on those kids. My goal would be that we'd be able to come back and report in months and in years to come the incredible opportunities that have continued because of your vision, your foresight, your commitment, and that's my hope. So. The other question I have would be legal. Uh, we just uh, changed the rules and then we went through the for that one event. The one event. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do we lend these to, uh, do we direct it to the legal department? Yeah, in essence, what, 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 what council would need to do, because <coughs> under the existing lease agreement between the city and the field zone, they are not able to subcontract the operation unless the city council approves that. Yeah, so there would be a, a con a, a basically a consent to the subcontract agreement. Um, and we put that together, and these would be the terms upon which we would agree to the consent. We'd obviously want to have some things like the same indemnities and insurance that we get from the field. We would expect that from you to the city as well. Um, I, I think there was an issue of a name change, maybe. We probably want to address that. So it could be a pretty short agreement. The terms of the lease would apply still. Right. Obviously, the Boys and Girls Club would, but there would be some things we'd want directly from the Boys and Girls Club as well. We could do that in a, a pretty simplistic kind of consent okay. agreement. Just to um, respond to that, and also, you know, we um, put in place based on your current standard that was in place for field zone and current insurance policy with Philadelphia, which I could email to you okay. um, at your convenience. And then the second piece is, and I, there's been a little bit of confusion about this, and I just want to make this clear. The field zone name is front and center and doesn't go anywhere. What you've created, <coughs> we just opened this club in Macomb County, and it was the Sun. It's named the Stanley Ian Babinski front and center, it's a mouthful, but it's front and center, <laughs> and it's, a boys and it's, a, it's part of the Boys and Girls Club of our organization. So field zone needs to be front and center, and, and I think we just leave it field zone, and it's in partnership with the Boys and Girls Club, and if it goes through some machinations decades to come, we deal with it, but I don't want field zone ever lost. Field zone has to be the identifier. So the kids in this community, the parents in this community own that and know it. So field zone doesn't, so as we craft that, I just want to make sure, I know that's a <coughs> your commitment, but 
I won't be part of something that says field zone isn't front and center first two words just that way, standalone. So. Uh, Can you tell me what would happen with the existing staff, the three individuals that uh, you just It's actually not the, it's not the three individuals. We met with the whole staff today. He did mention three but individuals. I mean in terms of employment. Yeah. Are they going to lose their jobs or what's going to happen? Let's wait and talk about your sure. analysis. Sure. We, uh, right now our arrangement is with um, Access Point. So we've met with all of the staff. Um, the three individuals that I mentioned, we only have two of them now. Uh, we've told all the staff that as of December 31, their um, employment with Access Point, the field zone through Access Point, will be terminated. This, uh, the week after Christmas, Brett will meet with each one of them, so I think actually starting tomorrow morning, we'll meet with each one <coughs> of them and interview them as if they were reapplying, understanding their background, how long they've been with the field zone, what they do with the field zone, their value to us. Um, and then by December 29th, each of them would know whether they were going forward or not. There will be, as I said, some efficiencies which result in um, a few of them. We actually have hired five people in the last two months to replace staff that have been there a long time that left or went to college or whatever. So, um, and I don't know that it's last in, first out. It's just who has the most passion for what we do there and isn't just there for a job. And um, so that that would happen in the next two weeks. I would just hope that the Preference, um, if not even security. Well, how about, uh, let me make this really clear because you and I are on the same page with this. This is this change isn't because any staff at the field zone did anything wrong. Oh, no, I understand. No, no, that, no. But I want to yeah. make sure that they're. Nobody from outside is being hired into this process. So everybody who's currently on field zone staff will have the opportunity to apply in the makeup of the staff because there's a $13,000 bleed every month right now. We've got to get it right sized. The makeup of the staff going forward is going to come out of this current field zone staff. So it's not like I'm bringing in somebody who's going to be suddenly sitting behind the front desk and greeting. These staff members have created great relationships with the kids. That consistency has to <coughs> be maintained. So that's my <coughs> commitment. The makeup of the staff will come out of the current field zone staff. It might look different in terms of positions, size, number, because we've got to get the budget to work. So they won't just have the first shot at those jobs, they'll be the only ones considered for the jobs. Um, my other concern is the membership will now be open to non cow Hill and non Lakeville residents. That has actually been the case for the last four months. Um, in the agreement that we did where you um, gave us a grant of $45,000 to make it through the end of the year, that was part of that agreement. And here's what our issue has been since we opened. We always wanted to make sure that we never turned a Southfield or Lathrop resident or student away because our club was big and we opened it to outside. So for the first two years, you couldn't be a member, you couldn't be there for a day if you weren't a resident or student of Southfield or Lathrop. Uh, what we found is that we're <coughs> about operating at about one-third of capacity on our busy days. So we, have, we might have an event where there's two or 300 kids, <coughs> but typically we have 80 to 120 kids there in our capacity is a little over 300. So here's the problem that we have all the time. Somebody's cousin is staying with them for a week. Somebody's uh, brother or whatever stays with them. Right now I'll tell you that of all the students that we have at the field zone, in the last four months since you allowed us to try this, we have had a total of five non-resident or non-students, total. So is it going to be recruitment? You know, you mentioned the fact that Boys and Girls Club and Roll Oak and Ferndale and Washington. Are you going to recruit uh, students from those areas to come here? Or are you going to try to uh, expand or give more awareness of the field zone here in South I only have one answer to that. That's the second part. Yeah. There are so many kids here. We couldn't, re you know, when I first. Um, came back as the executive director 10 years ago. There were some people, the program wasn't flourishing, it was kind of just bouncing along and wasn't where it needed to be. So people said, you realize what the population is happening in Hazel Park and Madison Heights, Royal Oak and Ferndale? You know, we've all seen this part of the county go down. That's not the problem. We couldn't possibly reach every youth in Southfield. 
if we wanted to. If they all showed up on one day, we'd be like, oh no, we're in trouble, right? So the focus has got to be on those who live in Southfield, attend schools in Lathrop. And I can tell you for me, my philosophy is, first of all, we're going to get more uh, repetition. If a kid comes to the Boys and Girls Club 75 times, 75 hours or more, that's when we start to see the gains academically. We start to see the reduction in alcohol and drug use. I need kids who are going to be there regularly. They're going to live in the neighborhood. They're going to live in the city. They're going to attend Southfield schools, Lathrop schools. That's where our focus is going to be. I don't ever see a campaign to recruit kids in other communities to attend here. Other than what he's talking about, which is a more of an operational issue, I don't ever see us doing that. And there could be some synergies where there could be a regional conference of teen leaders, and we'd love to host that at the field zone, to be able to show off the gem that it is, and where you might have like a two-day conference here of leaders from across the Midwest, that's different. But you're talking, I think you're referring to daily use, yeah. and daily use, absolutely, we're going to focus 100% of our effort right here. And from a practical standpoint, the reason we have so many middle schoolers is because Southfield Schools provides buses. The reason that we've had difficulty getting high schoolers is because they don't. So from a practical standpoint, it would make no sense for us to try to get students from other areas. How would they get there? So that was not our interest at all. All right, you can answer my question. I feel very comfortable about moving forward. Thank you. Um, Mr. Um, um, Mr. I'm assuming something, but I'd like to hear you give me an assurance, I guess. Um, uh, I'm familiar with the management procedures and the student control issues at the field zone. I think they're excellent. The, the uh, waving in of the card and so all of these things are going to stay the same, yes. correct? Yeah. Um, our our um, background checks for staff and that kind of stuff almost mirror oh. each other. Where theirs are stronger, we're going to make ours stronger. But not, none of the security measures change. None of the di we've our board has talked a lot about discipline. They do it a little bit differently. We have we have a um, disciplinary review committee that the judge uh, chairs. So it's if somebody has a problem with a staff decision, you go to a review board that's the judge of Southfield that is a parent that is a peer and a staff member and a staff member. Good luck with that. I mean <laughs> so, I mean you you gotta have a pretty strong case to have something to perspective. Well I'm glad to hear that. Uh, Dues the same again, so that uh, this is really important that you all understand. This is a up to one year agreement, right? So that we can fashion something more permanent. We didn't have a lot of time, <laughs> so this was a lot of meetings focused in a, in a, in a few months. So, so as we fashion something more permanent, we're not going to change any of our operations. We're not changing the hours, we're not changing the dues, we're not nothing. The biggest single change is we may lose a couple of staff members, mm -hmm. but that's for uh, you know, operation and efficiency. Oh, yeah. right. And just with the dues, just to emphasize this, the dues that are collected are going to the field zone for control. I don't want the dues. I want to be able to bring this to every kid in Southfield. 225 is the right thing that needed to be put into place. They have to be able to balance the budget. I want to figure out a way that we can do this and make this more accessible to more kids in a safe way, secure way but to give them the opportunity. So I'm really not interested in the views coming from the members. That's going to go to field zone and be reinvested in some ways that they deem. But philosophically, I like to see a lower number because I don't want an economic hurdle. I don't want a kid who says, you know, Scott goes and is at the field zone afterwards. And he says, Scott, how much is it? It's only 200 and a quarter. He's going to give the big Because I'm right? proud of my right. membership. In 200 and a quarter. My parents paid $225 for me to go. I'm going to go home and say, ah, i got something, I'm hanging with my friend, I'm doing this. I'm not going to walk in and say, my mom doesn't have a job. I'm not going to just walk in and self or ask for a scholarship. It's not going to happen. So I opt out. It's perfect the way it is. But I think as we move forward, we've got to make sure that this is accessible for everyone and there's not an economic hurdle. But you do have plenty of notice on something like that. So. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> I uh, went through your material and uh, have some questions. Uh, it seems remarkable that in your material you said that 100% of the students graduate from, from high school. Uh, 
um, that's a remarkable number. Um, was that uh, planning, program, coincidental, luck? 100 percent, it's no misses. Right, I know, and and I won't. Sixteen pregnancy. Yeah, I know. That so was my next question. Um, for us, um, we know there's research that tells us some standards out there that 75 hour commitment to get them for 75 hours, you see these gains. Um, I shared with the staff today those statistics and my goals. But I know there's going to be a 14 year old girl who's going to walk in and join. And she might be with us for three months and we're going to find out she's already pregnant. And I'm not going to be able to tell you anymore that our pregnancy rate is zero for all of our members. I can also tell you kids who leave and never come back to a club. So our goal is to keep them engaged. The kids who leave and don't stay engaged, you know, disappear at 13, maybe not reemerge, not stay connected to the club, do end up pregnant, do end up dropping out of school, do end up in doing all the things that we're talking about. So our job is to keep them connected. And I can tell you there's only one way I've ever seen it work. It's you hire great staff who love what they do, who care about the kids, and build relationships. That's the only thing that works. Either the 16-year-old or 17-year-old to come to a Boys and Girls Club or the Field Zone, for them to come, they're <coughs> making a decision because they can go anywhere at 16 or 17. So if I have a room full of teens, that means they've made a decision. And not because it's me. It's because there's some staff member that they've connected with, they've made friends, and then they come back. The head of uh, the Tampa Bay Rays minor league baseball system is our very first youth of the year from 1958. And he says the things that he learned, <coughs> the friends that he has, that he created then are still his friends today. So it does work. But I can't promise you that they'll be able to say a year from now or even tomorrow that all those statistics are the way they are. But I can promise you today that everything that I said about high school graduation rates, Teen pregnancy rates, those two, 100% and 0%, a point on. Now, are you, are <coughs> you saying that those students that spent a minimum of 75 hours are the ones, or no. anybody? If they're a current member of the Boys and Girls Club. So, you know, I have 1,700 members. Of those 1,700 and 17 and change, yeah. of those, 500 are 13 years in, uh, of age and older, it's about 550. All those kids, if they age two, they get to 18, they all graduate. They've never been pregnant through their teen years. That's what, that's okay. what I'm saying. Uh, another question in your material, you said that, uh, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase this, a significant <coughs> amount of your revenue comes from the Justice Department. Actually, the piece that has that is uh, from Boys and Girls Clubs of America. Boys and Girls Clubs of America does receive Justice Department grants that um, helps, especially in gang-related uh, funding, um, so it's it 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 is it is and it's really focused on reducing the gang problem across the country. So that's not my organization. That's the Boys and Girls. But you don't get any money from the Justice Department. We do. We we personally do. If we apply for it, it's called pass through funding, and we do get pass through funding from the Justice Department. And that's how we, um, a lot of clubs have been able to do exactly what we're talking about doing. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jennifer, you our two boards? Initially, um, the same way that it always has. Our board has always had, we have an executive director, formerly Lauren, now Linda, that is over all the staff, hires, trains, fires staff, and reports to the board. Gives us regular reports as we direct, meets with us, and does our, we cast the vision, and the executive director is responsible for carrying it forward. All that will change initially is that Brett now will be the executive director. He's not just the executive director of our club, he's the executive director of all of his clubs, and he's already paid by them. That's one of the beauties. That's one of the first things we'll save is our executive director salary gone. Um, but that's, that's all that will change initially. Where we go in the future, whether our board becomes an advisory board, we don't know that yet. That's what we're going to try to fashion over the next several months. Will you put in place possibly a marketing strategy to reach out to the places of worship and the nonprofit organizations to get more exposure that you're here? And uh, because many of them have youth groups that really need to 
You have to. You've got to get the information in front of the, the people who are in contact with kids. Eventually, kids will tell kids in your field of attendance. But at the beginning, the counselors in the schools, you've got to be able to talk to the faith community. You have to be able to talk to parents. So being able to go and working in partnership with the schools, which is a lot of that's in place, and we're doing that now, but just to build on it where we can come in during parent-teacher conferences and have a table set up. One of the things that we do really effectively, <coughs> we sit our rare local location alone, we run 60 tutoring matches a week. Not only do we run homework help every day, but sometimes a guy like me needs more than just the homework help. I need a tutor. I need somebody who's going to meet with me once a week. That's where mentoring comes in. So now all of a sudden I've got somebody who's sitting down and showing me how to get organized, how to stick to something, and, and, and tutoring. So the partnership with the schools, the faith community, and then eventually it becomes kids telling kids and it will begin to feed off of each other. And you continue to see all of those other things that you normally would do. But eventually it does start to take on a life of its own. Lastly, uh, and this may be the deal for me, mm -hmm. um, um, can you get Denzel Washington to come? <laughs> 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 I'll just explain it. <laughs> as soon as I get a cell phone number, I'm <laughs> yeah. to yes, but I keep trying to get it out of him, but I can't. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, you know, he, you asked that because, uh, for those of you that don't know what she's talking about, he's on their national board. Yeah. But uh, they have a board, like we have a board, that is um, larger than ours, um, more of a, we developed a board to get um, representation from every facet of the community we could think of. We wanted somebody from the city, somebody from Parks and Rec, somebody from Lathrop Parks and Rec, somebody from the schools, some we, somebody from the Neighborhoods Association, so somebody from some of our sponsors. So we, that's how we went out. They've established a more um, traditional board <coughs> where they have donors and they have uh, connectors. And we always say that if you're on a board, you're either a donor or a um, doer or a help me. What, what do I always say? <laughs> or a uh, door opener. So um, that they have that more traditional board. So they, they don't have Denzel on their board, but they have some <laughs> names that you'd recognize. <laughs> Actually, and I think five of their board members are uh, in Southfield. So they have. <laughs> Projection. <laughs> uh, it's the most um, recent facility that you opened was at the Washington Township one. What was that? Was that more of a transition of an existing facility, or did you build from the ground up? Is, I, I guess the heart of my question is. Which more typical for you, building from the ground up or taking or transitioning an existing facility to what you want it to kind of look like at the commission? Um, this isn't a flip answer at all. Okay. We'll do whatever it takes to service kids in the community. Okay. So we have a traditional club in Royal Oak, which is a log cabin. With over decades, each decade, a different donor said, well, let me build this, let me build that. Yeah. And in 2002, it was a complete renovation that created a senior center and a Boys and Girls Club. That's where I love it. Ferndale, we're in a public school, middle school and high school, under the same roof. Okay. Only students from there who attend there can come to our club. Okay. In Washington Township, we started discussions with the schools, but the schools are hemorrhaging. They don't know what the uh, building structures are going to look like, are they going to have to close some. It just wasn't working in the schools. There, a church came forward, like here in Southfield, and said, we just want to be of service. We'll open the facility. We're not going to charge you anything, and you come in and operate a Boys and Girls Club in the church. The township supervisor in Washington Township uh, last week announced that they have a dedicated park node. They're going to be building a senior community center that will house the Boys and Girls Club, and they're projecting that that will be done now within three years. When we started discussions with them, we didn't even think that. We weren't there with that. So it's every community can shape, can shape its own. I can tell you we had a Boys and Girls Club in America representative in the field zone last week. She called me up, she just got, got home, she lives in Asia, and she said, Brett, she said, I have never seen a facility like that in my life. So she was all excited. So I think what you've done here is something special. I do agree with you. I think what's happened is it just, a needle has been threaded, and <laughs> we'll just be grateful that the kids are still going to be able to have the opportunity to participate when they come to enjoy. I'm, I'm excited about this partnership coming together. So we think it's win, 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 yeah. for sure, for all of us. Uh, <coughs> I have a couple questions. Um, you mentioned, and you sort of already answered this, but you talked about your um, admission is like $20 membership versus $200 some odd. 
Uh, and that's not going to change, though, for the first year. Because if it did, I think you'd be swamped. And then my next question would have been, can you handle that many kids? <laughs> because we don't have the capacity for more than 300 at a you know, time. So I guess we'll, that will be the next phase. We'll find out about the... But, but you need to be prepared for that, because I have a feeling this is going to be something that is going to like and it's going to work. And we would like to see a lot more kids. And I think you're right that with the economy... And what, so many of our families are out of work, and the kids would love to be here, but the $200 is just a that's a lot of money to come here. And they have several kids, for two. Right. So, the other thing we're sensitive to, sorry. Go ahead. The other thing that we're sensitive to is that this is change, you know, and it's change at the holiday time. Right. So I don't want to layer on too much change <coughs> at this all at once. So all of a sudden, you know, I want folks, kids who are coming to see familiar faces. Right. I want everything to work like it always has so that they can get, move through this period of time and go, okay, this is working, and then start we can look at things and tweak. I agree with that. I mean, you have to see how you can handle what is there now, but if you are longer back in here, we don't want those things to be an obstacle to being available. So I, mean, I know you know that, and I know you feel that. The other question I have is, you mentioned this church that had something started or tied to in the here in Southfield, mm -hmm. and did you say they had money set aside if they're not using it for this? No, I hadn't. I, I had to open there because they'd approached us, okay. and it was, I went over. You know, I'd get these calls all the time, so I was expecting to go over and see a place that just wasn't going to work. Similar to when he called me, he said it's in the basement. <laughs> and I drive over, and you know, and I thought, oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm betting myself. Twenty kids, fifteen kids yeah. walk into the civic, probably eight kids <laughs> go down there. And the place is filled, and the energy is great. So the money that was set aside was the money they intended to open there that I had secured, which we just moved to. Okay. Uh, two other questions. Middle school, you're gonna, you want middle, I mean, we have mostly middle school now, but you want middle school and high school eventually to continue to grow, is that correct? And we talked a lot about the high school. Because I just wanted to get some. And my last question is, uh, you go for outside grants, you seem to yeah. Today we have to. It was, I was meeting with Linda Neighbors, who's the interim executive director, and who is her heart and soul into what she's doing there and um, in the middle of the meeting we had a wonderful grant that I had got, uh, received an email from Comcast. It was interesting we had had the money from Comcast and a grant that had been done and they had extra money at the end of the year and they called and said we've got some extra money. They didn't even have to write that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, right. And we've been talking to them for two years can't get anything out of them. <laughs> and now that we said that I'll knock on wood because probably they're all gone. <laughs> well I mean you know there's corporations that will give if you ask them and they make it one time but they have a full-time development director on their staff. Yeah. Yeah. I got that yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you would have picked that up. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm very, I'm very good. Personally, I think we all are. Um, Council, sure. yeah, I'd like yeah. to. Uh, did you have a question? I'm trying to make the motion. Yeah. Well, I was going to just refer mm -hmm. to our legal department to work with the two units that we have here and. They were at the, the goal was to get a rule ten tonight to approve the consent subject to whatever terms we could you know, we talked about we put in this agreement to allow the subcontractors. Do you make the rule ten I'll support it? Uh, I make a motion that uh yeah. I'll support it. A motion by uh Ms. Uh Jordan for the Mr. Vitalski. Do we need a do a no. rule twelve? No. 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 No.
Frazier? Yes. Mr. Fricanti? Yes. Mr. Seiber? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Mr. Lance? Yes. Ms. Seymour? Yes. And we have seven members of the motion to Thank you very much. I, ju I just want to say, I know I came in late in the discussion, but I was aware that the Boys and Girls Club, we have had conversations uh, a number of times about wanting you in the city of Southfield. I personally had this conversation, and I'm so excited that this happened. And look forward to, um, you know, the, the vision that we have for our community and our youth. Uh, you are a great keeper of that vision. So thank you so much for being here. And, and if I can, thank you again. I wasn't here for the meeting where you approved the one night uh, um, liquor license. Thank you for that. It was awesome. For those of you that were there, thank you for your support. I know some of you did concerts and some of you bought tickets. It was awesome. And everybody said, when are you going to do this again? It was really good. Thanks for that, too. Yeah, I was, the kids were unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we will.
I mean, the economy, you know, you can go back and see the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s. You know, you had ups and downs in the economy, but it did not stop us from doing anything. We built the jail, we built the jet court, we built the pavilion, all when the economy was going up, and that when it was coming down. And and that whole facility was built at $17 million. And, and because your prices are right, there's competition, and with the contractors and the bids come in right, and and so, you know, I I just am really disappointed in the fact that we did not go ahead and like I say, you know, I know council differed, mayor differed, everybody differed. Had three unions come in, from four unions come in from different parts of of Michigan that come in and speak against. It. I don't know what possibly they would want to come in to my city, our city. And, and, and stop a project. I mean, we don't go to their cities and stop projects. And and uh, and to give their place where they reside, I don't see anything wrong with that either, Mayor. Because you know, sometimes you know you have to know where the people are coming from that that are commenting on what the city is and how it's going to be developed. And I think that we're the ones that are supposed to make the decision on what we want to build, and not an outsider. This is our city. And and uh, we have a million two in our hands, and and I just don't get it. How you can now form a committee, and you see what Fields Zone went through. I mean, they went busted trying to raise money with corporations. The timing for corporations is wrong, but there's going to be a lot of grants federally that are going to be available mm -hmm. because that's how in the downturn, that's how we were able to build the pavilion, the court, and the and the police station, the jails because. They may bring that downturn, money available to get the economy going. And we may grant to raise the money to build those facilities. And that's the same thing you have here. I don't know how long it's going to take you to raise the million too. I don't think they'll ever raise it, to be honest with you. And, and if you're going to raise the million too, you're going to have to find, not a million too, but you're going to find another $900,000. I think the balance, I think it was 2.4 million for the building. So, something like that. Was that uh, correct? 2.1. 2.1. So you have more than half in your hands. So I just wanted to make that comment because I don't get it. I just don't get it. The, the families, the, the homes that are vacant, you want to bring young families in here. I mean, how are you going to showcase the city that either this is a place for families if you don't do things for families. And you heard people get up to the council meeting and talk about how their families and children enjoy these <coughs> kinds of things in their community. They have to go somewhere else. So, but you know, I've seen the council divided for whatever reason. They voted the way they voted, and I respect their vote, but I just, as a businessman and councilman and, and a guy that's been very involved in building a lot of things in the city, if somebody gave me a million two, I would be blessed. That's all I have to come in. Um, Mr. Simon, you have to Yes. Um, I think along with this trust, uh, we need to uh, create, um, and I don't think there's something to be done tonight, but I think uh, we need to seek nominations or uh, self-nominations, whatever, for um, <coughs> a Car Friends of Carpenter Lake Association that would be charged with raising money. Um, I've received emails from people who said they would be willing to construct. <coughs> uh, a lot of things get built with small contributions. Personally, I think that this needs to be built uh, with private money and uh, at this time. And so um, just to create mm -hmm. a trust fund isn't enough. Uh, I mean, I think that's, that's one step we need to take. I think the other step is to have uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, Friends of Carpenter Lake, to have, an, have an, uh, a structure in place um, which would uh, seek um, uh, donations uh, for uh, uh, either uh, the Nature Center itself or additional interpretive stations um, at Carpenter Lake. You're talking about the 501c3 that was discussed, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something I would like to refer to the finance committee to study some of these possible 
arrangements because we can't, we can't resolve that here tonight. But no. Uh, yeah. Do we have a finance today? Yes. Yeah. Oh, we do? We'll, yes, but oh. we'll add up all the expenses of the city. But my point <coughs> is that I think we need um, uh, some staff on this committee. I think we need environmentalists in the community. There are people that um, have offered um, or expressed an interest at least. Uh, and perhaps if we need people uh, on the council that would like to uh, be, on, be on such a group. But um, uh, we, uh, and, and I'm, I look to the, the chamber, we've got a, a new person who's uh, going to add um, uh, a new direction to the chamber and, and maybe uh, through networking or our business development staff, our parks and rec staff, there might be some other untapped things. Uh, I find that we haven't, um, uh, in my experience, and I'll just speak for my, my experience here, we have done, we t they tend to tap the same major companies and businesses all the time. And they've been damn good about supporting various clubs. But there are a whole number of others out there that I don't think have ever been asked. Um, and I think that's true for the Community Foundation as well. Um, there, are, there are people that do business with this city that don't have an office but do a lot of business, whether they're a legal firm or an uh, engineering firm, whatever they are. Uh, there are various vendors that um, um, uh, work with the city and the schools and so on that um, uh, could be asked if they, you know, not arm twisted, but invited uh, to support this project. I just don't think we've done enough uh, combing the bushes uh, to find to find the funds. Uh, and I, and I still think the door is open to future uh, state and federal grants for something like this. So uh, that's my take on it. Uh, I'd like to see the committee. Well, we have to have a discussion about what, how it would look. Yeah, and, th and that's fine. Yeah. I, 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 so, uh, so I didn't expect that, uh, you know, last week we talked about where we go from here. Uh, and so that's what I'm trying to do. Keep this uh, as, as future looking where we're going from here. Um, that there's the interest is there, it's just how it's done. How it's done. Well, that's why we're having this discussion tonight. We right. wanted to set up this fund that we can't accept money that people have pledged or might want to give us. To. We have to do that by charter. We have to, have exactly. we have to accept that money. And we have to have a place to hold it until. And, and that's why I made the rule 10. Right. And I'm prepared to make right. Once we vote on the rule 10, I'm prepared to make the second half of this motion. The corresponding motion. Well, um, we have a rule 10. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. We okay. haven't voted on it yet. Okay. We're having discussions. Sure. Uh, I just have a question about um, some of the uh, what what when the council voted last week. <coughs> did that affect the $140,000 from the EPA, or is that still is that ready to go into the the fund right now? Is that or is that a reimbursement? <coughs> I haven't had a chance to have a discussion detail. Okay. But it uh, it was earmarked for this project. Okay. Whether it could be transferred to another use um check on reimbursement? Yes a reimbursement grant, but it would have to be spent in the immediate future. So both the grants would be handled. What's the immediate future. Mm -hmm. Well in the next year. So we still have that money. Mm they would be looking for us to sign the project agreement committee to the project in the next, you know, they were expecting that this month. So you know, if you're not <coughs> moving forward with the bid right now and the construction right now, that'll, that'll just cancel out. Can so we reapply for that? Um, yeah, you can reapply for that grant. Uh, that is a short-term grant program that they keep adding a few more rounds, but it's not an indefinite like the trust fund. Yeah, uh, to, to the uh, I think it was said, I hate to say Scott Griffin, the MDB, mm -hmm. but the he told you, you don't have to get executive people who have mm -hmm. businesses on their board who can open the doors, have uh, internal uh, uh, people who meet on a regular basis and, and uh, 
in, in the business world to tap them. Uh, my suggestion, if you go that route, is to have a, uh, that type of a board. And that, I guess, would lead to the discussion when you uh, name the, the finance committee. Um, the other point I still want to make is if you're going to form a committee and you're going to go out and, and file for grants, you've got a million two grants right now. I mean, why would you start from scratch again? I mean, you got a million two in your pocket. And now you're going to start it as a group and say, okay, now we have a $2.1 million goal. And I, if I was a businessman, and I heard that, I said, well, why did you turn that million two? Now we got to go right over it, reapply, and if you may get it, you may not. I mean, Okay. Whatever council decides, I mean, pardon? You can I mean, it depends on whether you want it or not, because you're not going to raise the money, and there's no way. We've gone through these things a hundred, a thousand times. You've seen the field zone go through this, and everything that we touch that, that has this kind of a thrust I, I agree with you. You need some corporate type people on there. I agree with you. That, that have a vision for well, the environment. And they're going to ask you if there's business people like I know. How could you turn out a million two? Huh? And there's, and there's, an, anyway, answer, there's an answer to that. Okay. I'd like to know an answer because I can't understand that in my world. The answer is uh, uh, at least three people on the council didn't approve uh, or feel comfortable with the funding mechanism. <coughs> That's why. Well, what if, what if the funding mechanism was you take the million two and then go form this, this corporation committee to raise 900,000? <coughs> it would be simpler to raise the 900,000 and tell somebody we got to raise two million one. But anyway, I'm going to drop it. You vote the way you want. Is that your motion? Yeah. Jeremy. Yeah. 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 Okay, where are we? You made the motion. Who's second? Jeremy. Jeremy, okay. Um, I, I, I'm struggling not to rehash the conversation, so I, I'll just let it go. All right, we have a motion by Mr. Sauber, supported by Mr. Lamar, to approve
depends on us showing that we're trying to collaborate. Um, the city administrator would need direction from or support from the council to do that. Well, that could be a consensus for us and explore that. We have some other items that I'm going to put. Uh, we'll be submitting shortly, but uh, uh, even a consensus would be good because I want to include this. All you have to do is show intent. Mm -hmm. So this is showing intent. And so we can consensus. All right, so we'll go around the table and start. So what's now? What to do? Show
Roy, Lo, uh, Roy's Destination Center is now operated by um, a 501c3. And that is, that is a, a physical um, nature center facility. Um, I volunteer for the Royal Nation Society. No, 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 please, please, no, no, I can't, I'm not, you can't just keep me out of your Listen, let me, let me answer the question, okay? Farmington Hills has a nature center. Madison Heights has a nature center. They do operate these. Uh, Troy's, I don't know, Troy's changed something, but they have like five or six full-time people, which other most places don't do that. Uh, there are a number of communities, and you can look at the internet, the nature centers, and all the time. There's quite a, quite a few of them. No, they're no, operated no, by the city. They are operated by the city. Are they, are they operated out of their <coughs> operating budget, uh, out of their well, general fund? Well, I don't know how they are, but... Well, I don't know what fund it doesn't say, but some of them, most of them do have memberships available or like a small admission fee. Because I know that uh, <coughs> we've, <coughs> we've tried several things that are, and I'm going to quote Vince Lombardi, that uh, mm -hmm. outside of blocking and tackling, the basic things that we do, for instance, our, our, uh, our Center for the Arts, uh, we thought that we knew what we were doing and I mean, that was a money pit. Uh, we, we were forced into buying condos. Those turned out to be uh, money going the wrong direction. So we don't do a very good job of, of running stuff that's not basic city business. So uh, for us to get involved in this and take that on as uh, something, that's why I asked the question, are other, are other municipalities funding these out of their general fund or are they getting money from someplace else and it just got their name on the, on the front of it? Well, so I, think, well, I know that Farmington Hills funds their own. I know they have and they do use volunteers for the program. They did, uh, because of the economy, what they had a naturalist that they let go, but they've got volunteers to do their program. Uh, other communities, volunteers are used a lot because they're people that are passionate about what their the programs are doing. Um, that you'll find that's very common. The difference between the University of Michigan and using the students are in that environmental program. Um, it's very common. The, um, my train of thought. Um, and you said, oh, they, we don't do very well operating those things. When we took on the, what became the Center for the Arts, it had been, we had agreed to buy it and it had deteriorated so much that when we bought it, we had to replace it. As you know, a lot of infrastructure, <coughs> all of the heating and cooling and the roof, we had to do a lot. So that was, that became a mindset there. But in terms of the, the, the $200,000 uh, mortgage, that was given to the Parks and Recreation Department, and I think it should have been either the facilities or the general fund because it, it was uh, still in their budget. Well, it doesn't matter because well, it just went backwards. But I think it's, it's all tax dollars and it was going backwards. That's why we had to get rid of it. That's the matter. Anyway, um, it's hard enough to check it out. Yeah, yeah well, that's why I asked the question. Part of the research for the finance committee, uh, we, can, we can find out uh, what's know, the best how, way to do this. That's the whole how they're organized, right. where the money comes from, etc. Some neighboring uh, facilities. Yeah. I want to do it, and I want to do it right if we're going to do it. And I just don't want to make it a short term thing where we build this too. Two million dollar thing that gets open two days a week. So that just doesn't make any sense at all. And then we shouldn't have started in the first place. Yeah. Been going on for years. All right. Um, we have uh, a couple. Of uh, before we leave this, uh, part of the uh, issue that Carpenter Lake brought up was our existing facility when it came to parking lot, and I really want to review the current. Um, a review of our current facility, a priority set by uh, administration and Parks and Rec and the uh, board of what we, what we need to bring our facilities up to mm -hmm. the standard that um, we would expect in the city, and what are those priorities, what are the budgets, so we know where that Parks and Rec budget is going. Because that, that <coughs> figure that kept getting thrown up is $7 million sitting in the bank that they haven't spent. Um, no, six. Now six million. So. <coughs> and the projection that I know last <coughs> they took eight hundred 
out of that sun balance. So there was a lot of things said during this discussion that was all over the place. We need some facts and some reality. And Parks and Rec needs, you know, I I heard that they were told not to spend it. That's why there were no investments in facilities. And then I'm told that they just sat on the money. So we, we need some real facts. There is no $7 million. I don't know where that number came from. There's some real facts <laughs> that we need to see. What are the priorities for facilities? Do we have the money to do it? And it needs to be, just like we do our budget, it needs to be at least a five-year plan for Parks and Rec, because they have a separate million, yeah. so that we know where we're going with that. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, we're, we've already had discussions that uh, <laughs> this this year's budget and the total analysis of the Parks and Recreation uh, is going to be more exhaustive than probably uh, any in the recent history, if not in recorded history. Parks, Parks and Recreation was uh, uh, we, need, we need to pull up in the exact work of the work we've done for the general fund. We had to address the general fund first because mm -hmm. that's right for death. That's, part of, that's public safety. Mm -hmm. Police, fire, everyday uh, services, uh, parks and recreation uh, uh. is important. Uh, and we'll get, we'll get the attention uh, uh, the, the numbers in the back of the top. We need, a, we need a full look at Yeah, where does the park's master plan fit into all this? It's part, of, it's part of where, it's part of the review. Uh, that's, there's priorities set in the master plan. Uh, <coughs> some are, some are uh, more of a wish list variety. Some are more uh, pragmatic. Uh, so we need to take a look and bring that into the picture too. But first and foremost, we need a five-year look at <coughs> what are your operations going to look like? What are your revenues going to be? As, as we know, the next two years, next year we're looking at 11% drop in, in taxable values so far. Mm -hmm. I hope uh, some one or more persons is that number wrong. But that's the number that I've been using. That's the number we've been using since July 4th when we uh, updated the, the financial plan for the general fund. And we did that based on information from the equalization director, uh, Oakland County Equalization, and interpolation of other economic information. Uh, I'm hoping that number uh, is totally pessimistic, but so far I don't have anyone to, to counterdict it. The lowest number I've heard is 8%, so it's, it's going to be a drop that's significant. The year after that, we're looking at another drop. Okay, hopefully that's wrong too. That's right. Uh, keep hoping that my number is wrong, which is, uh, I don't believe so. Uh, then we're looking to for uh, a leveling out and hopefully uh, some increases. So we have to look at that five-year look very closely. <coughs> and then we have to uh, look at our capital program uh, up against uh, that, that uh, you know, the, the resources that are available. And, and <coughs> I, I said I didn't want to react to but Jim, that's what's tying the concern that I have is that if we're using some balance to balance our books, and you're saying 11% decrease, we could build the most beautiful facility, but we're still going to have to operate it. And operating funds are coming from an already established deficit in cost and rent. And so tied to the, what the Finance Committee needs to look at is not only the construction of this, where are we going to be with being able to fund it and operate it? And if we're using, we're taking almost a million dollars out from last year with the crisis that we're having, and we're going to have a 11% decrease already on top of that. And, and that's why we just, we, we just have to do the right thing and build it when we can afford it.
been to done yet? Chamber of Commerce. It's, it's, uh, it's their business and not our right. business. Okay. Um, all right. Yes, uh, <coughs> I'm on the, the board of Common Ground, and the executive director, Tony Rothschild, called me the other day and said that uh, they're going to apply for a grant. It's a, a very, very large grant, but it's going to be a grant that's divided by different groups around the country. And one of the things they're going to, the, the thing that they're going to study is obesity. And uh, they need the, uh, the cooperation <coughs> of schools, of the medical field, a nonprofit, and the community, the city, the municipality. And he asked me if, if, if I thought that Southfield would be interested in being part of this, this grant. And I can't tell you any details about it because uh, I was driving in my car when he, when he called me and I didn't make any notes. But I said uh, I would bring it up at the, at the council meeting, but I thought that we would be probably eager to get involved in something like this. That, and I talked with uh, Wanda Cup Robinson, and she's, she is also very uh, positive about getting involved. In fact, she named a school that might be one of the schools that they take a look at because they want to look at the elementary all. school. <laughs> I don't know. I, I can't, at this point in time, I can't tell you. I called Tony again today. He was out. So I can't. Uh, and what he called me was on the weekend. Or it was uh, Friday, Friday afternoon. And uh, I called him today, and he was out but, and didn't return my call. But uh, it's something that... Uh, I would urge us to to get involved with, especially if it's uh, going to show our new governor that we are cooperating with other entities. That, um, well, what do you recommend that we do? I mean, how do we get into Well, the uh, there's going to be a meeting on the 10th of January uh, where the, all the details, but I will continue to, to talk with him and bring back whatever details he can tell me about so that we'll know kind of what we're getting into. Okay.
two hundred pounds. And he got off with the kids and he started to rip their coats off and jackets off. He said all of them were small. And he I was in my car driving by and I said, What are you doing? Why are you doing that to the kids? He ignored me and kept tearing their coats off them. Friday afternoon. Now the bus driver said nothing, I don't know if he looked or anything. That's serious. That big boy was bullying the little one. He was ripping their coats off. I think, uh, Ken Siver, you should say something to You should, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have the connections in the school. I can hear one of them. I can hear one of
in big houses. Um, um, I've got two requests to be recognized, and I told them that they could. I'll give my address to the city clerk. That's fine. Okay. But my name is Pamela Jura. You know, I'm I'm just sitting here like and my mind is like totally blown on a couple of issues. The first issue, and this is regarding the comment about passing the note. We just had a gentleman that didn't even live in this area outburst and start talking to you guys and got your attention in reference to a nature center and that particular information about Roy Lope. Now, if you're going to address passing the notes to council people, which people have freely done, and I don't know if there's anything in Robert's Rules of Order that speak to that, make sure you address the comments from a person that has not been recognized by the council president. That would be most appropriate and procedural as well. Now, we are talking about this, this grant money for the Nature Center, and Councilman Fricasi said we are blessed with a capital B to get money for a grant. Let me recall the blessing from FEMA. 2.1, and I was corrected, and I apologize for all the times that I've talked about the grant. I said it was a 2.2. I was corrected tonight that it was a 2.1. Are we not equally as blessed to get a $2.1 million grant from FEMA for our firefighters, I am insulted when we talk about all these things we're doing for a community and trying to revitalize Southfield. Let me refresh your memory from an economic development standpoint. You can do all the real estate showcasing. You can give away all the houses at a, at a crazy price, which is good for first-time home buyers. But a community is only as strong as its public safety, police, fire, and EMS. Now, how blessed are we to get the grant for the Nature Center, but we're not blessed to get the firefighters grant to bring back the firefighters? And then I wanted to correct Councilwoman Jordan at the last televised meeting. You said the library cost $37 billion. I thought I heard you say with a B, it was $37 million with an M. And if you remember, the library cost an additional 800000 because one of these council people sitting at this table held up the project. And I'm sure you were one of the ones that was equally as upset as the residents were about that extra $800,000. Let me also refresh your memory. We had an opportunity, and you guys discounted what I said. We had an opportunity to buy Carpenter Lake for $250,000. Another member at this table sent the grant back. A church bought the Carpenter Lake for the same price and sold it to the city for $1 million. Are we making the most frugal financial decisions? I don't think so. So while you're pushing this interpretive center that the mayor has already vetoed, while you're setting up all this fancy schmancy financing, why can't we set up the same trust if you guys don't have the courage or the gall to accept that 2.1 grant for our firefighters? That's an insult. 
That's an insult. So now can the residents, uh, Madam Attorney, set up the same type of trust to go hit these same companies up, especially the ones that got tax abatements like Lear, $24 million. Can we hit them up for trust money for our firefighters? Since you guys don't have the courage to accept the $2.1 million. And I would like an answer, please, while I'm up here so I can do a follow-up. Can she answer, Madam Chair? No. Oh, okay. Well, maybe you'll answer it off the record, or maybe I can get Mr. Barris to answer it. But I'm, I'm really upset. There's a standard for certain people. There's a standard for certain companies. There's a standard for certain projects. And if you guys really want a standard, if you really want to put a Southfield standard in place, you ought to write a mission statement. Just like you got strategic goals on all the, the walls in the city of Southfield, write up a Southfield standard. Put some concrete things on there. Say what we're going to be a conduit to and for. And until you do that, don't... <coughs> Did you want to say something, Ms. Jordan? I wasn't talking. Oh, okay, but I mean, I'm asking for uh, the council's attention, and it seems like you're more, fo more focused on the time. It hasn't quite been five minutes, because she will tell me very, very, very strategically that my time is up. But thank you again for the distraction and all of the other stuff. I really appreciate it, since we're talking about procedure and appropriateness and proper protocol. As I was saying, I'm really upset. I wish you guys would stop, look, listen, and think and think about the decisions that you're making in the city. I heard you. I wanted to finish my statement. Proper procedure. Uh, the next person uh, that has to be recognized is Stephanie English. My voice is good. She's asked if she can put these posters up, I guess. No, no, I, 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 don't, I mean, I don't care. No, that's
that Chief Thomas had actually conducted the investigation on Brian Gerald in 2009. I have a, a passed out uh, private letter or, or confidential memo that actually on page two reports that Brian Gerald actually conducted his own investigation and when these allegations were reported by Nick Lucia originally at that time that Chief Thomas dismissed those allegations. My contention is that someone is not telling the truth. If Chief Thomas, as stated in the December 1st memo that was read by Joan Seymour at the December 12th meeting, if that is the case, then someone is not telling the truth. Brian Gerald admits here that he conducted his own investigation, changed the time report, and actually, and in this, in this letter, he said that uh, Joe Thomas dismissed the allegations. Why would a person have to commence an investigation on themselves if their boss dismisses, dismisses it as rumor. Sometimes a guilty conscience needs no accuser. He admits that he found four days of the allegations of the 30 plus allegations. If he found four and he was allowed to change the record, his own record, then that's where the illegality comes in. I just have two questions. The memo that you read from on December 12th says that Joe Thomas did conduct the investigation. I have done several FOIA reports. We can end the FOIA report. All I want to know is if a proper investigation was done, Chief Thomas has paperwork. If it was not done, there is no paperwork. That's it, period. If, if the proper, and, and the conflict <coughs> comes in, is Brian Gerald admits to investigating himself and altering the records pertaining to the allegations against him. Here's the proof. Did a proper investigation take place? Brian Gerald says no. Joseph Thomas and Jim Charette say yes. The conflict, the proper investigation was done by Chief Thomas. The most important question that settled it, where is the paperwork? For small police items, there could be four pieces of paper for little small incidences. With this kind of conflict or this kind of allegation, there's going to be a packet submitted to HR or to the city administrator. If Joe Thomas did not do an investigation, I know that December 9th, Nick Lucia met with Jim Charette and the HR director, and he resubmitted 30 to 40 allegations that can be supported and corroborated. <coughs> that means that this is a new allegation situation, and by law, an outside police agency should be contacted by the city administrator or an acting police chief as these re allegations are now resurfaced. That's what I am contending. I have nothing against Chief Gerald at all. I just want right processes to come forward. I want someone to stop pushing this issue back and find out the truth. In light of the above, I to ask why has Brian Gerald not been, I didn't put not, not been removed as a viable candidate for the police chief because there is a cloud here that has not been settled and it is a lightning rod and that's all I have been trying to push forward. An outside police agency, I called the test of the state police and the feds. The state police cannot come in without the invitation of the city administrator. If I change my word to the feds to embezzlement and conspiracy, they can come in with out any invitation. I am not trying to cause any embarrassment to this city. I care about the integrity and the appearance of propriety of this city. I have been trying to just push this forward as a question. It is a legitimate question. And like I said, right there, number three, the police have the culture, everything is documented. They are ready. <coughs> Mr. Lance said that the investigation was done on the 28th. I asked the question at council to every single council member. If so, where is the paperwork? I am tying up city resources and employees by now, if you're not going to tell me the truth, to really nitpick. But we can stop this all if we just have that report. And if not, let's start all over. The time is up. To the chair. Number one, there was an investigation. There is paperwork. I haven't received okay. it under three, three times. There was an investigation. There is paperwork. Brian Gerald Number says two. no. Number two, Dr. Joseph E. Thomas is in the employ of the U.S. Department of State training police officers so our troops can come home. We have governors going down. We have politicians we going have down. And I've never been out of order. Yes, you are. And this is not a dialogue. He has, he's responding to this. This is not a two-way conversation. He has the right to respond to your allegations. You have to, you have to respect that. Dr. Thomas is an employee, employee of the U.S. Department of State, senior police advisor, deputy director of police training, and he is currently in Baghdad, Iraq, and he is in a dangerous situation. But he's there, okay, because he's highly qualified, the 
state, the, the United States came and asked him to serve this duty, and when he tells me something, I take that as the truth. All right. I have talked to him personally several times about this, and when he was home on leave recently, I spent two hours at his residence talking to him about this. He has investigated it. He has said there's no there was no disparate treatment among the deputy chiefs. Deputy chiefs are not paid for overtime, and so there's flexibility in how their their time and compensation is is their, their work time and scheduling is flexible. Now, number three. All right. The police department has a payroll system. There was a list handed to me by a lieutenant. When I asked the lieutenant, did you give that list to the chief of police? You know what his answer was? He didn't ask for it. That is a preposterous answer. That is a preposterous answer. I, told, I talked to our outside attorney about that answer. That's the word he used, preposterous. How can a person ask for something that he doesn't know exists? So, again, I've asked Dr. Joseph Thomas to investigate it. He said, yes, I have. I investigated the, the comparable treatment of others in the deputy uh, chief's position, and the settlement of the issue was as follows. One, uh, 32 hours, which was uh, uh, deducted from the employee's uh, vacation bank, and secondly, what he did, uh, what the chief said that he did to avoid any confusion in the future is that he said that they improved the procedure and that there has to be um, another review uh, and signature on everyone's time uh, report. Uh, and that is what he determined to be an appropriate uh, response, and it is on the record, and there is a document where that amount was deducted. As far as uh, the allegation the employee did their own investigation, the employee reviewed records, okay, but the, the chief of police did the analysis, did the, the discussion with other people, and he made the decision. So Brian Gero told a lie, he's not going to I do have some concerns, uh, Madam President. I think if we allow residents to speak five minutes, we have to hold to that. It cannot be flexibility because if you, if you don't hold to the rules for one, you've got to waive it for everybody else. So I think we have to be set aside so that you're fair with everybody, but we have to stick to the rules and it not be wavered.
it's the same thing if it's on a computer screen as if it's in two pieces of paper. And I, for one, would be willing to start that process. Um, I've talked to some other council members who are very comfortable with technology. I know a city clerk has constantly asked for that. It comes, it's, it's time. It's time for us to embrace technology. And you can turn the pages, it could be a Kindle for everyone, and turn the pages. And those are only $100 a piece. And the city doesn't have to buy, I know I have iPad. Some of us, have, other of us have laptops. Uh, if the city wants to have one at every council chamber like other municipalities, so when you sit down, you just pull up the agenda and you can move paper, uh, move it around and read it. Instead of us wasting all this paper, we talk about environment, uh, we're killing trees, and we have less people to do all this paperwork. Two questions. Um, do we have wireless in this uh, facility? And here, and the second question, um, do we have the uh, power to plug in if we need a battery was low or on all of the, uh, on the diet? Yeah. Do you want to answer that one? Supposedly there is wireless in this room and the program already does exist for, if anyone is willing to try and wants to bring in their laptop or their tablet, I would be more than happy <coughs> to see if what we have already created in the clerk's office will work if we want to pilot it. We have the technology already online that you can plug in and have them ready for the wireless. Um, one of the problems is you need to plug something in. Um, like right now I'm sitting in this bundle of cords. If we don't have the proper technology, I mean, I don't think we have enough outlets in this room and I can't speak for the chambers. I would be afraid someone's going to trip and fall. I've almost fallen several times on this little corner. Um, so, But some of the tablets, um, I use a laptop in here and just depending how long our meetings are, they will go on battery, you know, the charge. So <laughs> I'm willing to work. I know a few people have expressed their interest in and please, I'm willing to move forward for those who want to try it. Bring a laptop. I, you know, I have a tablet, I have a laptop, I have an iPad, but for me, I'm a visual learner, uh -huh. and for this, for my city council position, I just prefer all the paper. It's just, it's better for me to learn, so I think it's each individual. Um, I would prefer, I don't know if I would want to put this on my computer, because I'm, I'm hands-on, so it's, it's, it varies for each person in terms of what type of learning. Well, that's why I said whoever is interested, I'd be willing to try it, if someone wants to pilot it, um, I'd be more than happy to do that too, because you're right, everyone's You know what, that. I think the transition, and I, I hear what you're saying, I remember when I had the Franklin plan, and there's no way in the world I was going to transfer my schedule <coughs> to uh, a computer or a handheld. I, I just could but my staff forced me to try it, to keep my Franklin, but to put this next to me, and it, the transition happened. And sometimes, like you said, there are some handouts we'll still have to do, like the boys' club mm -hmm. and some other things. But I'm sure they could have emailed that to us. But um, it is a oh. transition. But oh. I think if we all try, and even if we have to have our papers for a minute, and then you'll find that you can look at the same thing on the screen. But it, it's a transition, and it's something that we need to move forward on. It's, a, it's 2012, and we're still carrying around all these papers, papers delivering them to houses. We're, we're it's, it's time for us to move forward, it's, and it, it'll be good for the city. But I understand there's a transition, but I think if you put them side by side and we can try, I think uh, we, can, we can make that transition. Yeah. I guess, you know, I don't mind that, but I just had a situation, for example, last week where uh, a city administrator gave me the, the appeals that one of the corporations made, and I have to see the treasurer in in the uh, lobby, and I said I'd like to know exactly how much money is 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 lost by the city. And then he sent me he sent me a uh, uh, letter from our attorney who handles our appeals, and, and there was yeah, I couldn't get the attachment, so I never did. Today I still don't have my answer mm -hmm. using my computer at home. So I mean. To me, 
something that's important that I need the information on or would like to have the proper information on, I don't want it a week later. And so I, but when I find the, the treasure somewhere and see the bags are packed, uh, I'll ask them what the answer to my question was, okay? And, you know, there's going to be some places where we got to start. So when you ask for it, sometimes you have technology issues. But there will always be the clerk there with a paper uh, for us if someone can't reference it. So we'll, I think we can work it out. But, you know, I asked at the entire city center meeting, <coughs> when I closed the city center group, mm -hmm. that an entire city center be wireless. I agree. And, and, uh, I agree. And George was supposed to be coming up with something, and that's when they found out this room did not, you, could, you cannot bring wireless into this room. So I don't know what happened. I, I, Jim probably knows. I think they I, turned the wireless on and it was turned off. And I believe it turned on in both this room and the other room. And you know what? It, again, if anyone has a laptop or a tablet or anything, I would love to work with you. And maybe we can just try it. If you want to stay with paper, that's fine too. But well, George uh, has, has offered to help anybody that needs help. So. We're, she's our tech we're willing to help. She sent us a letter not too long ago saying, you know, she'd like to help us out if you need questions. I thought she called me the other day, you know, about the time for Kathy at Southfield, and I get my other email, and I don't get the other one. So that sometimes it's got to be transferred, and I like to have my stuff at home. So now that she want, doesn't want me to get city information on my computer. Because the company might come around and take my computer and get the information from it. So confidentiality is also involved in this thing. So I don't know. It's up to well, whoever figures it out. And right now you can go to the website and if you go under the clerk section and you scroll down the left side of the page you will see council agenda. If you click on the name everything in the packet is right there. Everything is postmarked. We've been doing this over a year and a half. So it's already there. It's just a matter of you need the tool or the instrument. And then now that tablets are becoming popular, I don't know if people like laptops or tablets and there's different types. So it's already in place. It's already set up. If someone wants to bring in <coughs> whatever they have, let's just see if it works. See if you like what we have. We need to um, modify the We've talked about this for a long right. time. And it's just somebody has to bring the program or how we're going to do it and the cost of how much it's going to cost mm -hmm. and, and see if everybody's on board. And we've never arrived at that consensus. So it's well, still on the table. Well, if, example, the mayor offered to bring her tablet, there is no cost. Yeah. It's right there. <coughs> it's already well, done. I'm not going to haul my laptop. Okay, well. I know Jeremy has said he would bring his. I don't know about that. Mine's so yeah, an older one. Is that are available, and that's something you can look at. Yeah, so the problem was, and I, I brought my laptop to the first okay. meeting. Oh, uh, I'm okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I, I brought my laptop to the first meeting, but the problem was is that the closest plug was behind the city attorney uh, chair, so the plugs aren't even reached. So uh, that's, a, that's a huge problem right there. Um, but the program is up there. It's very user friendly. I, and you could go right, if I had a laptop right now, I could pull up everything in this binder online. So uh, it's worth investigating if you're interested, um, if you want to pay for this. Well, it seems to me we can look into fixing the electrical issues. Yeah, that, that was the main hiccup in that very first meeting where I brought my laptop, is that the plug wasn't even reachable from my chair. Anyone else want to weigh in before I say something, Mr. Yeah, I, uh, Actually, uh, I agree with uh, Ms. Jordan that uh, I'm more tactical than that. And I ran the uh, the Ameritech training center and we used, we put all the lessons on, on computers and, and we found that there was a, a lot of pushback on some of it because of the amount of reading that you have to do. And with our package, this is a skinny package compared to what we normally get. And if I, if you send it to me on email, then all you've done is transferred the cost of me printing it myself instead of uh, being done. It. And uh, I'm doing a city's business. I'm not, I'm not 
supposed to be uh, printing my own stuff. I mean, it's the city's responsibility to get me the material that I need for, for this meeting. So, um, I know that I do not like to read large volumes of stuff on a computer.
Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy holidays.